Chapter 171, Sorcerer Barriers Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation The Sorcerer Will To master Sorcerer Barriers, the crucial aspect for every demon hunter sorcerer was the Sorcerer Will. It was the key in the generation of Sorcerer Barriers. Sorcerer Will was the reason why those black sorcerers who focused on studying the mystery of life and death could never cast a sorcerer barrier. However, the sorcerer barrier's rules contradicted the logic and knowledge possessed by an elemental sorcerer who pursued the knowledge of truth. Unlike the other sorcerer's knowledge which could be quantified and equated, how sorcerer barriers were generated was full of mystery. Indeed, sorcerer barriers were special. First, the defense of sorcerer barriers was overarching and sturdy against the foreign world creatures. It was the most reliable defense shield of demon hunter sorcerers. As long as the void fortress of the sorcerer world existed, sorcerer barriers protected demon hunter sorcerers similar to an iron tortoise shell. Its defense against a single attack was the nightmare of foreign world creatures. However, the generation of sorcerer barriers relied heavily on the original will of the sorcerer world, and its defense against the creatures from the same sorcerer world was feeble. This prevented the demon hunter sorcerers from becoming god's apostles in the epic novel. 1. Most of all, sorcerer barriers could only be mastered by praying. Demon hunter sorcerers must first sacrifice a small portion of his soul to a material called astrological stone which must be passed to the guardian of the sorcerer world to be placed into the world core. Only then will the demon hunter sorcerer be protected by a layer of sorcerer barrier wherever the original will of the sorcerer world existed. In the years of prayer, the sorcerer would picture himself as an organ or a cell of the sorcerer world devoting himself to the sorcerer world. As the will of demon hunter sorcerer became more devoted each day, the strength of the sorcerer barrier grew stronger accordingly. This devotion was merely a familiar feeling every world guardian possessed. Blessed by the world core with extraordinary powers for its devotion, a world guardian was still protected by the sorcerer barrier outside the sorcerer world, even in places where there was no original will. Due to the eccentric behavior of the sorcerer barrier, black sorcerers could never cast one despite the fact that they were sorcerers. Although sorcerer barriers were extremely important for all demon hunter sorcerers, the organization of the Black Isotter's Holy Tower stated that the mastery of sorcerer barriers was not mandatory since its logic was against the law of arcane knowledge. There were a handful of elite demon hunter sorcerers who did not practice sorcerer barriers at all. It was an ability limited by the surroundings. Every precious second spent on praying would be wasted for elite demon hunter sorcerers who had a precise goal to achieve. Grimm's view on the sorcerer barriers was that they were a new version of the ashen mask enhanced with a defensive shield. Grimm did not spend a lot of time praying to consolidate the strength of the sorcerer barriers. Focusing on such practice would consume a massive amount of his time that was better spent on the study of destructive energy knowledge. However, Grimm possessed world core fragments. Despite the limitations of the sorcerer barrier's super defense, Grimm must master sorcerer barriers to a certain level to ensure his own safety in critical times like in the previous war of foreign land. He needed to participate in such wars to bring his destructive energy research to the next level. Grimm had to decide how strong he needed his sorcerer barrier to be. Holding the astrological stone, Grimm hesitated unsure whether or not to put this astrological stone on the Four Seasons altar. If the astrological stone contained a soul piece of a demon hunter sorcerer, it would be a beacon that revealed the location of this demon hunter sorcerer. Therefore, all the demon hunter sorcerer's astrological stones within the system of the Holy Tower were heavily guarded, preventing their positions from being known by others. Once Grimm put the astrological stone containing a piece of his soul onto the Four Seasons altar, it would be sent directly to the World Guardian, who would then place it into the World Core. A soul fragment was the most vulnerable weakness of every sorcerer. If it were to be obtained by other sorcerers with ill intentions, it could be used in the worst imaginable curse sorcery. 
It was similar to how Grimm gained his knowledge when he was just an apprentice sorcerer. Without soul fragments, such knowledge transfer could not take place. After being in silent contemplation for a long time, Grimm finally made a decision. After checking the security of the dark demon hunter sorcerer hall, Grimm stood in front of the Four Seasons altar in the middle of the room, holding the astrological stone with his eyes closed. His body's magical fluctuations seemed to be undulating as he breathed. As time passed, the undulating fluctuations became more intense. Suddenly, Grimm let out a scream. He shut his eyes with great effort as his face turned pale. In the vision of his sorcerer eye, there was a grey spark in the air that was magically wrapped, then absorbed by the astrological stone. After a few breaths, Grimm recovered from dizziness and regained his consciousness. Such an experience was similar to the process of gaining a soul slave. From the very moment he invested into the Four Seasons altar, the soul spark Grimm sliced from his soul was considered as gone forever. However, if he had given it to a soul slave, he could still recover his soul fragment after the death of the soul slave. Click. Grimm placed the astrological stone on top of the Four Seasons altar. Hum? Just as Grimm placed the astrological stone on the Four Seasons altar, Grimm faintly sensed two regular chains representing spring and winter protecting his astrological stone. It seemed to be having its own beautiful welcome ceremony. Grimm could barely sense the spring chain by using nature force. As for the winter chain, it reminded him of the world guardian in the crack at the edge of the world core. The one who guarded the destiny lever with a snowflake beside him. Was it possible to have two equally powerful guardians in the sorcerer world? The small fluctuation of the destiny lever that absorbed the astrological stone on the Four Seasons altar disappeared. Grimm felt newly gained senses, an inexplicable instinct. He felt the flowers and plants on the ground, the insects between the branches and the leaves, the squids and shrimps in the creeks, the giant trees in the forest, the cheetahs leaping across the forest, the sea monsters in the deep ocean, and the human wizards passing through. These were the sorcerer world's will of life. Ha! Huh? A transparent defensive hood with no elemental properties surrounded Grimm's body, generated by Grimm's sorcerer will. Grimm closed his eyes and touched the sorcerer barrier in excitement. However, his excitement turned into disappointment almost instantly. What? Only one tilde three degrees of defense? According to the conversion of sorcerer barriers in the foreign worlds, it is only two tilde four degrees. Any demon hunter sorcerer who did not work on his praying would have a sorcerer barrier that was nothing but a display of bubbles. Grimm shook his head in disappointment. Suddenly, he felt a disturbance within his soul. Grimm experienced such volatility when he was promoted to an official sorcerer. Mysterious energy flew from the world core and blended into Grimm's soul. Grimm evoked the original will of the sorcerer world and synced with it. With a thunderous sound, Grimm's sorcerer barrier was strengthened by a few hundred times. Once again, Grimm closed his eyes and touched the sorcerer barrier with his hands. He even took out the crystal ball to confirm his findings. After an hour, Grimm gradually opened his eyes. The strongest degree of defense is 633 degrees. It may reach 800 degrees in a foreign land, and it is possible to surpass 1000 degrees of defense when it is close to the void fortress. To sustain the sorcerer barrier at such strength, even if one were to possess 100 points of mental strength and have the corresponding magic power level, one could only channel it for two hours. If one were to willingly reduce the degree of defense, the sustaining period can be extended. Grimm realized the absolute benefits of the apex sorcerer apprentice of earning their world core fragment reward when they were promoted to an official sorcerer. They had better protection compared to other newly officiated demon hunter sorcerers. Though other Apex Sorcerer Apprentices' defense bonus by having the Sorcerer Barriers was not as indomitable as Grimm thought, it was still a considerable level of 200 tilde 400 degrees. In foreign worlds, the Sorcerer Barriers' defensive power was further enhanced. 
As long as the demon hunter sorcerer still had magic power, no ordinary level 1 creature could harm the elite demon hunter sorcerer within a tortoise shell. Translator Notes 1. God's Apostles, were spirits that guarded an ancient city in the novel The Journey of the Time-Traveling Orc. They cannot be harmed by ordinary attacks. Chapter 172, The Hunter's Promise. Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. As he was gliding in the sky, Grim glanced at his new neighbor on the other side of his castle. He flinched and came to an abrupt halt in the sky at the sight that he saw. Hem. It's her. On the vast green valley, the silver strands of hair danced with the wind and naturally revealed the little sparkles on her forehead, the icy crystal-like white robe she wore was speckless. Those clear bright eyes also stared at Grimm with the same surprised expression. This demon hunter was Ice Age Millie. Of the neighboring castles on both sides of Grimm's castle, one was occupied by the infamous demon hunter, Angelus, while the other had been left empty for quite some time. Grimm never thought that Millie would someday end up being his neighbor. Grimm's mind turned quickly at this new discovery, eventually, he gave up on the idea of returning to his castle and flew towards Millie instead. Congratulations on becoming a real sorcerer, Millie, he congratulated the sorceress as he hovered in front of her. A light breeze flurried between the ten-meter distance separating them. Millie's gaze became unfocused as she stared at Grimm's dark eyes, calm and far-sighted. She vividly recalled their fight back at the Holy Tower years ago, that memory of hers was still as clear as day. Did the once infamous demon hunter purposely dull his blade again? Millie's initiative displayed her manners as a sorceress towards Grimm as she questioned, is that Lord Grimm's castle? Yeah, for about thirty years now, Grimm said as he nodded. Judging by her looks, Millie did not seem to have changed at all. She still had her same old face, as if she had managed to balance her body's vitality and mentality well after becoming an official sorceress. However, from the aura and vibe she was exuding, there was no doubt that there were some intensive changes somewhere within this sorceress. Oh? For me to have the honor of being neighbors with Lord Grimm, it must have been the arrangement of fate and destiny, Millie replied while gently tucking her hair at the back of her ear. At the same time, she dispersed the white foggy icy gas on her face, revealing her face completely before Grimm as a sign of respect. Grimm nodded at her words, he too was impressed with the coincidence of fate. How's Mina? Is she an official sorceress yet? Grimm questioned. That fearsome woman back when they were still apprentices left quite a long-lasting memory for Grimm. Millie shook her head and replied coldly, my sister became an official sorceress way faster than I did, thanks to my father's arrangements. However, he wanted her to become a sorcerer guardian. With that talent of hers, she will definitely not let father down. Millie stopped short before she added, if Mina has the qualifications as a sorcerer guardian after 1000 years, not only will I become much more inferior to her, even Lord Grimm may. Grimm chortled softly then said, with that personality of hers, it would be quite a sight to have her serve the sorcerer world unconditionally like a slave for thousands of years. After his comment, Grimm suddenly remembered something. With a slight shift in his mental strength, the space above his shoulder distorted and a miner with bright colorful feathers appeared. Hem. This is. The miner flapped his wings to maintain his balance, he was a bit confused for being summoned to an unfamiliar location, so he took his time to get used to his surroundings. When he finally noticed that he was summoned to the yard next door, he got furious and yelled, God damn it. You can just call me for this kind of distance. Ah, Lord Minor. Ah. Cor call, Lord Grimm, it's a misunderstanding, just a misunderstanding. Grimm glared at the Minor before he returned his attention to Millie asking, remember this. Isn't this the parrot that was sealed in the handkerchief? Millie exclaimed in shock with her eyes wide open once she got a clear look of the Minor. Damn you! 
I'm not some kind of idiotic inferior creature. I, Lord Miner am the great steel emblem miner of the sorcerer world. The miner was like a cat whose tail was stepped on, its feathers frazzled and unruly like a fighting rooster as it yelled at Millie. Just by his reaction alone, one could easily tell that the miner did not know that the sorceress in front of him was the one taking care of the only lead to its existence in the sorcerer world when it still resided in the dimensional gap. Ah. Uh. Millie stared at the hyperactive miner on Grimm's shoulder blankly, but deep down, she was extremely shocked by the creature before her. What kind of power does this little creature possess that makes it worth the trouble of sealing it into the dimensional gap since ancient times? Boom! Suddenly, a loud roar of thunder sounded from the thick clouds above their heads. Under the tension that the thunders created, a blood-red crescent moon descended from the skies. It was Millie's first time witnessing a sorcerer world's void fortress, she was completely stunned at what she was witnessing with her eyes and mouth wide open. She watched as the dark shades of the sky ran past her, spreading darkness across the vast blue sky, covering the bright sun above their heads. The horizon gradually became darker by the minute. All mechanical flying objects eventually came to a complete stop in the sky. Countless sorcerers spread out into the sky like a swarm of locusts. The crown of the tree of life gradually opened like a blooming flower bud. Grim had his brows furrowed as he grumbled, just like what the butler in Third Dupique said. The wars in the sorcerer world have been occurring more frequently in the past century. The Holy Tower of Seven Rings had shortened the long exotic war cycle to once every seven to ten years. I guess it's the same with the rest of the elemental holy towers as well. It may not be as frequent for the non-elemental sorcerers holy tower organizations, but overall, the wars of the foreign lands are occurring more and more often in the sorcerer world. Grim glanced at Millie who was still in a state of shock. He had seen the astonishing sight of the tear in time and space from the void fortress multiple times, even though it was still an impressive sight to behold but it was no longer something special for him. Ahem. Grim coughed twice, pulling Millie back to reality. After he got her attention, he explained, this is the standardized process of inciting a tear in time and space from the void fortress. You'll get used to it. All right, let's go to the top of the castle and borrow the altar at least 1000 degrees of magic power, they'll reward us with one sorcerer essence. Sorcerer Essence. Millie could not believe what she had just heard so she ended up repeating Grimm's words. Demon hunters have this kind of welfare treatment. She knew how difficult it was for her father who was an arcane sorcerer to earn sorcerer essences. Grimm nodded his head as he controlled the nature force to let his body levitate, then he turned and flew back to his castle. The miner on Grimm's shoulder did not look pleased for some reason. His small eyes gave Millie a nasty glare as he pulled back his eyelids mockingly. Uh. Grim. Millie called. Grim turned towards her with a confused look. Do you have any interest in completing some demon hunting expeditions in the foreign worlds together? I know we're not exactly friends, but I think we'll be able to help each other in the future. Millie said, staring at Grim with her clear icy eyes filled with anticipation. Completing expeditions together. Grimm had managed to get a better understanding of the foreign world's development expeditions for dark demon hunters throughout the years. Overall, dark demon hunters were not only responsible for the initial invasion of the foreign lands, but most of their expeditions were also to conduct rogue destructive massacre in a team of elites formed by two to three sorcerers. In other words, they were responsible for wiping out a vast group of guerrilla warfare in foreign lands. Therefore, it was said that it did not matter whether anyone was fighting alongside a dark demon hunter as the war focused more on individualized operations and small-scale operations. Unlike bright sorcerers who worked in delicate team operations, every dark sorcerer possessed complete sets of combat systems for most of the scenarios during combat to ensure their survival. Ideally, 
Grimm preferred working alone as it was much easier for him to conduct full-scale plunder on various types of resources during demon hunting expeditions. However, if he placed the study of the potential elemental sorcery destructive energies vacuum period into consideration. Grimm turned around and replied, in less than 170 years, my compulsory expeditions will end while yours would need 200 years. Millie shook her head and said, I'm not like you and my sister who need to digest high-level sorcerer knowledge after becoming an official sorcerer due to the short amount of time you two went through during the apprenticeship period. During my time in school, I stayed at the top among the sorcerer apprentices for 60 years. In addition to the 30 years back at the Holy Tower of Seven Rings, I believe that I have made all the necessary preparations in order to graduate as a formal sorcerer. 170 years will be enough for me to be familiarized with the basic knowledge of an official sorcerer. After Millie had her say, a gentle breeze blew by, revealing the sparkling icy diamond-shaped crystal on her forehead. Grimm gave her suggestion a thought. Along with the sorrowful cry of the war horn from the Tree of Life, he stated without hesitation, if that's the case, I guess we can go into the details when the time comes. I still need to focus on some long delicate experiments in the coming years. Millie's face lit up as she nodded in acknowledgement. Seeing that Millie had agreed to his idea, Grimm flew to the top of his castle without waiting any further. After half an hour glass. Boom. The blood moon was at least one million meters in diameter when the void fortress re-entered the tear in time and space from the top of the tree of life taking numerous demon hunters onto a new journey. Chapter 173, Experiment of Despair Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation After sending the altar 1000 degrees of magic power, Grim eyed the miner which was happily chewing on his nuts. He then opened a black crack with his magic. Standing on the altar, Grimm opened the space crack from his own castle's void fragments with ease. He stepped into the crack without any hesitation. A ten-meter-tall tree grew on an island that was covered with black sand and the waves of the sea surrounding it. Energy pillars continued to support the sky. Making slight adjustments to nature force, Grimm flew towards the tree which was located in the middle of the island. For Rangu flower spirits fluttered their tiny wings as they approached him. Then, they paid their respect to Grimm with their entire body trembling in fear. Grimm glanced at the two newborn spirits. The two little creatures instinctively made a frightful cry and fell onto some tree leaves as they had forgotten to flutter their wings. Grimm knew that it must have been the two elder spirits who taught the little fellas about the terrors of evil sorcerers. Ignoring the concerns of the little creatures, Grimm examined the gold ginseng mother tree. Once he was certain of its health, he retrieved multiple Jujulong stones from the dimensional gap and tossed them to the Rangu flower spirits. Grind them to dust after increasing the previous measurements to double the amount, then scatter them around the roots of the mother tree, Grimm instructed. Yes. The spirits responded in a shaky voice. Grimm did not pay attention to the spirits after giving his instructions. He simply checked the experimental plants that were planted around the island before he flew towards the experiment materials that he previously collected from the Seven Rings headquarters for dark demon hunters. Thirty sets of black-skinned skeletal humanoid creatures continued hibernating in the icy seals, nothing more, nothing less. Grimm circled the specimens deep in thought. To collect despair, even with the unique negative emotion-gathering technique that black sorcerers had developed, Grimm believed that the greedy flame giant's consumption of hatred worked the same as collecting despair in certain cases. These two both focused on the collection and usage of negative emotions which might efficiently decrease the amount of effort and time Grimm needed in his study on the collection of negative emotions. Even so, the study on the collection of despair would still use up Grimm's time on the study of destructive energy. However, if viewed in the long run in terms of his demon hunter career, it was worth the time. With that thought in mind, Grimm had his magic power surging from within as he slapped the vast ice container. 
By adjusting the Earth's repulsion strength, Grimm levitated the container before he disappeared into the world's fragments along with it. On the altar of the Demon Hunter Castle. The space distorted and Grimm appeared on the altar with the ice container floating above him. Under his control, it landed gently on the ground with a soft thud. A. Eh? Lord Grimm, are you planning to choose a new spirit servant from these creatures? The miner appeared when the space on Grimm's shoulder distorted. He curiously observed the thirty foreign humanoid creatures in the container. These creatures. Their capabilities are too low, they are merely specimens for experimentation. Grimm stated as he randomly pulled out a frozen humanoid and placed it on the experiment table. After that, he thought of something and secured the creature with green lines made from his magic. The first step in collecting despair was to fill despair. According to the vicious rules on the dark side of the sorcerer world, every black sorcerer was destined to feel despair. If he had never gone through that process, he would be a high-quality humanoid experiment specimen for dark sorcerers instead of being one himself. For a dark sorcerer to feel despair, there were two steps, to either experience despair from test subjects or to experience it themselves. Either way, he had to experience the immense power from these sorts of negative emotions. Grimm believed that these cognitive processes were quite similar to the observation of destructive energy that he had been conducting up until now. Hum, to let the specimen experience despair. I wonder what I should do. After half a month. This very day was the weakest period of Grimm's intoxication sorcery. Staring at his creation on the experiment table, Grimm was unable to hide the red flushes he got from his overwhelming excitement. This creative experiment was something that Grimm had spent a total of three days to plan and ten days to conduct. Up until this point, the black-skinned creature's skulls had been transplanted onto monkeys from the sorcerer world. The rough sewing techniques on it greatly resembled Master Piranos's facial art. Fortunately, the life force of these creatures was strong. Even in their frozen state, their souls continued to burn within their skulls, releasing its spiritual fluctuation. As for the creature's body, Grimm had used certain sorcery techniques to maintain their physiological functions and planted a few playthings inside. Those playthings were none other than Grimm's symbiotic insects, gadfly. If it still doesn't feel despair after all it has been through, I guess I have no choice but to switch the specimen, Grimm mumbled as he injected two bottles of magic potions into the creature's brain. After that, he started observing the specimen for any changes in its emotions. With a black crystal ball floating in the air, Grimm started to record his experiment, with his eyes shimmering with evil anticipation. A quarter of an hourglass later, the specimen's soul started to fluctuate. Grimm immediately rushed to the specimen's side when he noticed the changes. Hum, a quarter of an hourglass ha. Huh? This creature's immune system is supposed to be four times weaker than a human's. I guess they've started to develop a strong immunity system along with the advancement of magic potions by human sorcerers throughout these years. Grimm mumbled as he made a motion to summon the crystal ball closer to the specimen. The creature's face started tightening and relaxing simultaneously. These were all signs that its soul was gradually awakening. The stabilization of the soul's fluctuation takes up to 9 minutes and 50 seconds. This is three times faster than humans. Does it mean that the time in the foreign land where this creature resides in is three times faster than the sorcerer world? Grimm diligently recorded all his thoughts and inspirations in his notebook. No, one of the books of curses mentioned something about this before. Once you study in depth into the curses, it branches into different fields of study and one of them is the study of an organism's biological clock. The humans in the sorcerer world are really strange, even though the sorcerer world runs on a 12 hour glass and 24 mechanical gear rotation basis, we humans are still biologically functioning on 25 hours. Russell, Russell, Russell. Grimm's quill smoothly ran along the pages of his notebook as he wrote down his words. Therefore, 
Some sorcerers speculated that the humans that reside in the sorcerer world during the ancient ages were not locals, hence the abnormal biological clock reaction. While some sorcerers surmised that the sorcerer world originally rotated in a 12 and a half hour glass time, then changes gradually occurred in the rules of the sorcerer world. Suddenly, the specimen's face contorted visibly. Grimm only gave it a mere glance before he returned to his thoughts. The specimen was currently still undergoing the awakening of its soul, its memories were frozen in time before it was sealed into the ice. The struggles it was going was probably the pain it felt from that part of its memories. For the specimen, it was experiencing a nightmare, which means that time was still required for it to fully awaken. Beep, beep. The machine on the experiment table made a soft signaling sound but Grimm did not pay much attention to it. It was an instrument that recorded vitals, one of the sorcerer's most commonly used experiment instruments which recorded the life force of the specimen on the experiment table. The notification earlier indicated that the specimen's life force was gradually depleting as its soul was awakening. This was a normal phenomenon as the body of a monkey was unable to support the needs of this foreign creature's soul. With the rejection of the body as well as the lack of energy supply, this specimen was destined to live a short life. Of course, the theories regarding it involved other high-level sorcery knowledge as well, but they were meant for another time. Grimm was not bothered by the specimen's awakening process, instead, he went back into deep thoughts. Theoretically, Humans have half an hourglass per day that serves as their weakest period. During this period, our biological clock, our body and all immunities of the soul will be at the bare minimum. High-class cursed sorcerers use this weakness to calculate the caster's weakest period and cast their curses. As for black sorcerers who study the meaning of life and death, they will also use the characteristics of an organism's biological clock in their vast field of study. Suddenly, Grimm came to a halt in the recording of his thoughts and narrowed his eyes as he turned to the specimen. At the same time, the specimen's eyes snapped open after a vehement struggle and their eyes met. Let us begin. Grimm said as stopped all thoughts, and placed his entire attention on the observation of his specimen. The noseless black-skinned skeletal humanoid specimen flinched before it showed utter terror on its face. Grimm knew that it was frightened by his sorcerer image. Grimm lowered his head and wrote in his notebook. Terror is neither hatred nor despair. Crook, 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 a few simple toned phrases indicated that the languages of these foreign land creatures were far inferior compared to humans in the sorcerer world. They had limited changes in pitch and their emotional changes were direct. Therefore, it was said that the body of these creatures was mainly controlled by their emotions rather than rationality. However, judging from its soul, Grimm could tell that the specimen was probably cursing and begging out of rage and fear. Still, there was no changing the fact that it was still an inferior creature that could not communicate through their souls. Hence, Grimm would never know the true meaning of its language in detail. Eventually, the specimen started to realize that Grimm could not understand its language and began to struggle physically, then it finally noticed the abnormalities in its body. After it caught sight of its chained body, it let out a loud shriek with an obvious cry of desperation. Hem, that's not right. Why doesn't it feel despair? Grimm asked, confused at what was happening. Despair, a feeling an organism feels when they lose sight of hope in the future. According to the records, demon hunters started to collect despair after these foreign creatures lost the war during the development of foreign lands. Did the specimen still have hope that I will return it to its initial state? Is that why it doesn't feel despair? With that thought in mind, Grimm ignored the cries of the specimen and moved two steps to the side revealing the creature's real body that was placed behind him. The headless black-skinned skeletal body was laid on top of another experiment table with numerous pipes sticking into it. Chirp, 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 the specimen screamed in desperation. This made Grimm happy as his guess was proven to be true, but he was disappointed that it had yet to show any despair. Then, 
Grimm approached the body without a single word, he then activated his magic and started controlling the gadfly in the body to go on a rampage. A suffocating atmosphere soon filled the air. After that, the once hard black-skinned skeleton started to loosen up, gradually it showed signs of the separation of an independent mutated life form. Suddenly, a mutated organ popped out of the body's belly button. Crook chirp chirp, crook chirp chirp, crook chirp chirp. The specimen let out a devastating cry in despair. Grimm savored the feeling of despair in silence as the crystal ball recorded the image of the current situation. Bang! The mutated body was torn apart, transforming into millions of mutated life forms. With the concentrated energy of the feeling of despair, the creature too passed away in despair. Beep, beep, beep. Still, the instrument monitoring its vitals indicated that the specimen's life force had yet been fully depleted. According to the sorcerer's life form energy supply rules, the creature's body should maintain its life force. However, there was no doubt that it was completely dead. The only explanation was that despair had fully depleted the creature's life force and dispersed it outside of the body. However, the instrument recording its vitals was unable to detect these sorts of changes. Still, if a black sorcerer collected these types of despair energy, their base sorcery offense power would have a permanent rise when attacking creatures of the same species in the future. This was how black sorcerers collected despair. His initial experiment was a success. Grimm summoned a greedy flame giant with a wave of his hand. This five-meter-tall giant was simply majestic as it released an astonishing aura with its pure black flames. Its belly opened and gobbled up the soul of the deceased specimen. After that, it swung its huge hand and pulverized all the mutated life forms. Finally, it let out a voiceless roar before it disappeared into thin air. On the bloody experiment table, Grimm focused on writing down all the data and inspiration he gained through the experiment while referring to the footage in the crystal ball. If he were to keep this up, Grimm would be able to harvest the results of his initial despair experiment that was enough to satisfy the needs of a normal foreign war in the future. Half an hour glass later, Grimm sat down at the dining table and started eating after a simple wash. After that, he proceeded with the evolution of basic elemental imprisonment punishment resistance. Grimm's life in the demon hunter castle of the Holy Tower of the Seven Rings had started to follow a simple routine as he began to familiarize himself with the long lifespan of a sorcerer. Chapter 174 The Dawn Sages Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation 150 years later in the sorcerer world, a hundred and fifty years would carry different meanings in various time and dimensions. To a normal healthy human in the sorcerer world, a hundred and fifty years was basically his entire lifetime. This was Old Ham's entire lifetime too. To the sorcerer's academies in each of the tower regions, a hundred and fifty years was one and a half round of the Holy Tower qualification battle. During this period of time, Countless other gifted apprentices, like Ice Age, Bell Sound Dictator emerged too. Nonetheless, to some full-fledged sorcerers a hundred and fifty years was nothing but a short amount of time that could come to pass just by running one experiment. In the eyes of these real sorcerers, these boastful, conceited top-ranked apprentices were just a bunch of kids who were fooling around. Every sorcerer had such an experience when they were younger. Thus, most of them would respond to all of this with a smile. To the tree of life of the holy tower of the seven rings, a hundred and fifty years. It was merely a formation of annual rings on the tree, just a measly five diameter increase on the annual ring. Thus, the seasons changed as days glossed by. The sorcerer world continued to change and flow, in its own unique rules and ways, spanning the long stream of time. Beneath the bright noon sun, Grimm stood next to his bed in the castle, quietly sipping his fragrant afternoon tea. Twenty years ago, Angelus, Grimm's neighbor, had finally returned from the void fortress. 
he used around 130 years to complete his usual demon hunting missions. Usually, progressing through the foreign worlds and completing demon hunting missions would take over hundreds of years. Sometimes, these missions could take over 200 years. And to these demon hunters, they did not only need to battle against countless creatures from the foreign worlds throughout their progress in the foreign worlds, they needed to handle something far worse, taking out the rogues that were defying the sorcerer's domination and the few guardians of the respective foreign worlds. They had to keep on doing that until there were no other life forms that could threaten the void ship. And when that happened, their mission would then be considered complete. Meanwhile, Angelus and the little miner appeared to be discussing something as their wry laughter echoed across the grounds. Right after coming back from his demon hunting mission, Angelus immediately went for another trip in the foreign worlds. Three years later, he came back and began some academic pursuits with bright sorcerers. Thus, in the past two years, Angelus had been visited by a lot of bright sorcerers. As time went by, their visits slowly became much less frequent. The bright sorcerers were different from the black sorcerers. Bright sorcerers were not only socially functional and friendly people but they also tend to form groups that shared collective academic progress and knowledge. This sharing of knowledge was mostly done by small groups that were formed by a handful of willing bright sorcerers. Through doing that, they could strengthen the bond between fellow bright sorcerers while also compensate for the academic blind spots that they, the bright sorcerers, tend to overlook. The bright sorcerers who had achieved significant breakthrough in their research would then be recruited by the Dawn Sages, an organization formed by the elemental sorcerers from the Holy Tower of the Seven Rings. When that happened, these bright sorcerers would receive an abundance of resources and privileges within the group. Angelus was one of those who got to join the Dawn Sages, the achievement he gained from his three-year research opened up a window of opportunity. Of course, these had nothing to do with Grimm at all. The Dawn Sages were only interested in recruiting the Stigmata Sorcerers and the other top elites amongst the Arcane Sorcerers and Bright Demon Hunters. The Dawn Sages was a platform for the top elites from the Sorcerer Continent in making academic exchanges and collaborations, there was no room for a low-level Dark Demon Hunter. The Dark Demon Hunters from the Sorcerer world were mostly monstrosities that had gotten used to various harsh environments, maximizing their capabilities in the front lines of various operations. Therefore, Grimm, a sorcerer whose interest was to pursue groundbreaking academic knowledge, was not considered an authentic full-fledged dark demon hunter. After having his afternoon tea, Grimm disappeared from the window view quietly and headed to the alchemy lab. There were only less than 20 years before reaching the due date of the demon hunter mission. Although Grimm did not have much success in his research on destructive energy, he was, luckily enough, able to acquire enough strength to live through the next demon hunter development conquest via constant meditations, double evolution of ancient voodoo poison formula Lienti, replenishment of the magic power within his low-level demon hunter equipment, and the powerful protection from the original wall that was contained in his sorcerer barrier. At least now, Grimm was not a weakling compared to the other senior level 1 demon hunters. In fact, he was far sturdier in his defense compared to most of them. In the past century, Grimm's attributes had changed quite significantly. Mental strength, 98, magic power, 919, 1087. Constitution, 325, stamina, 212, 255, strength, 195, 384, vitality. 130, 184. The only thing that Grimm lacked at the moment was to train and enhance the various attributes he had. For now, Grimm only had about 98 mental strength. If he were to train it up to 100, he would then be able to allocate more time into doing physical training instead of meditating. When the time was ripe, Grimm would then be able to stop the evolution of the Lianti poison and focus more on training all the attributes that came with his constitution. After years of training using the ascetic prison from being tempted by delicious food, 
Grimm's 10 basic elements resistance had been raised to around 230, 370. If only he could raise these already unusually high elemental resistances by combining them with a mixture of powerful defense from his stamina and the sorcerer barrier's powerful protection from the original will. In the alchemy lab. Forging a mystic eye for the mask of truth was an extremely difficult task. Despite having taken extra vigilant steps in carrying it out, Grimm still could not avoid making mistakes in the forging process twice in a row. The first time was acceptable, yet, the second mistake almost cost him dearly as it nearly undid every effort he had put in before this. However, after spending some sorcerer essences, Grimm was able to purchase some valuable magic ingredients that were able to, fortunately, save all the fruits of his labor. Thus, even though he had income from clearing demon hunting missions, on top of his demon hunting allowance, food temptation training ingredients and his original 63 sorcerer essences, Grimm was now only left with a dozen sorcerer essences. In just a month's time, the Mask of Truth would break out of its initial form. It would then possess both ultrasonic sorcery and mystic eye, becoming Grimm's ideal version of the Mask of Truth. Although it was still a long way to go before it reached its mature form, the day for that to happen was not that improbable anymore. Sitting at his usual spot, Grimm silently dipped his quill in high-tier magic ink and started to draft down sophisticated sorcerer runes. After approximately half an hour glasses time, Grimm, who was drafting down a nervous system on the Mask of Truth, suddenly frowned as he put down his quill and took out his crystal ball. Hem? It's her? After pondering for a moment, Grimm decided to charge it up with magic power and established connection with the imagery that was connected to the other side of the crystal ball. A beautiful, voluptuous feminine figure appeared in the crystal ball. It was Claudia, one of the despaired, whom he had encountered during the gory test. Other than that, they had worked together during the Holy Tower qualification battle but was exiled from the battle zone by one of the three sorcerer apprentices from Section 11 via activating someone else's runic badge. Still, despite being forced out of the qualification battle and had half of their points left, Claudia had already earned enough points to become a demon hunter for the Holy Tower of Seven Rings. The only regretful thing was, Claudia was only able to rise up to become a full-fledged sorcerer 70 years ago. This, essentially, made her one of the last in her batch to graduate from being a disciple. As for Kyrie from the Black Isota Sorcerer Academy, whom Grimm was more concerned about, according to Sam, who was actively contacting him, he was not able to be promoted to be a full-fledged sorcerer. At this rate, he might be stuck forever in the Holy Tower all his life. Other than that, the Earth Heart Wiki, another difficult opponent whom Grimm had no way to deal with, another difficult opponent who also possessed unique knowledge in sorcery too had ranked up to be an official sorcerer a hundred years ago. Grimm was able to establish contact with him once via his crystal ball due to him being still interested in the secrets behind the wiki-activated reincarnation great sorcery. Glimmering within the crystal ball, Claudia lightly bit her rosy lips while throwing an alluring gaze with her starry and seductive eyes. Then, she quipped with her sweet voice, Grim. Furrowing his brows, Grim replied immediately, If you've got something to say, just say it. Also, we've got nothing to talk about if it's about what happened the last time. Despite having formed a brief alliance, Claudia was not a pleasant sight to Grim. In fact, he did not like her at all. After ranking up to being a sorcerer, Claudia wanted Grimm to be her sorcerer spouse. Needless to say, Grimm rejected her right away. After all, Le Fay, his sweetheart during his sorcerer apprentice days, was still warmly residing in his heart. Besides, Grimm was too engrossed in pursuing more knowledge in sorcery he had no time and energy to spare in committing to another sorcerer spouse. If he could finish his demon hunter mission and return to the Black Isota hundreds and hundreds of years later, by then Lafty would have ranked up to be a full-fledged sorcerer too. This would be a good thing for Grimm, they could then spend an eternity together. However, if Lafay still had not ranked up to be a sorcerer by then, 
300 years would have passed since Grimm became a sorcerer. In other words, Le Fay would most likely have died of old age by the time he returned. If that was the case, Grimm would have to deal with the great despair and immense heartache as he accepted this cruel reality. Having met with Grimm's cold rejection, Claudia was not upset at all. Placing her pale snowy finger on her lips, she threw him a seducing smile, tee hee, if it's something you're unwilling to do, my dear Grimm, I surely wouldn't force you to do it. If you don't want to be my sorcerer spouse, perhaps you and I could become a temporary romantic couple, a romantic fling if you will. Nonsense. Without hesitation, Grimm cut off the crystal ball's power. Then, he stood in place and pondered a long time before turning towards Millie's demon hunter castle that was next to his. In accordance to the law, demon hunters were required to make an appearance in the demon hunter headquarters 15 years prior to the due date of their 200-year missions, this was to ensure that they could better schedule their missions. In other words, 200 years was just an estimation. The actual length of time needed would still depend on the confirmation from the Holy Tower's scheduling. It was possible that after Grimm appeared in the headquarters, there was a stigmata sorcerer forging a foreign world conquest and thus he could depart almost immediately. Of course, he might still need to wait for decades before he could depart. Nonetheless, looking at how frequent the sorcerer world had been forging foreign world conquests recently, if he showed up and registered for a demon hunter mission now, he might be able to receive a new mission within just a few years' time. In half an hourglass's time, two silhouettes swooshed up into the sky and disappeared among the vast traffic of demon hunters and flying machines in the clouds. Grimm and Millie were now headed towards the dark demon hunter headquarters. Chapter 175 The Basic Knowledge of Chimeras Translator Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Whoosh! Whoosh! Two silhouettes landed on a series of stairs next to a door shaped like a hexagon, it was the entrance to the Dark Sorcerer's headquarters at the Holy Tower of Seven Rings. As they landed, two rays of powerful elemental energies cloaked the two sorcerers as they stepped through the door. One of the elemental energies was a bright blue water element while the other was a burning red fire element. A pair of bright eyes shone from underneath Grimm's cloak, blistered with a crack of electric element, staring at Millie who was tagging along behind him. Millie was shielded by a satin sheet of white mist, glistering with starry blue glimmers. The mist emitted a breath of calm subtle icy temperament, shaped like a long arctic chilly white snake slithering and floating around Millie almost as if it was acting like a thin layer of protection membrane. Hem. Has her power in manipulating nature grown this significantly? Suppressing his shock at this sight, Grim calmly commented, a void fortress was only constructed half a year ago for an expedition. The Holy Tower of Seven Rings launches an expedition every seven to ten year. If we were to register for a demon hunting mission now or for an extreme hour several years later, it would not make much difference at all. Hidden within the white icy mist, Millie replied, let's hope our first demon hunting mission would send us to a peaceful orderly foreign world. One that has a stable law that maintains its order. To the demon hunters, an orderly world meant that the natural law of the said world was almost identical to the one in the sorcerer world, one that had seasons, days, and nights, and also the natural law of life and death. There were many conquests that were launched by the sorcerers before them that went horribly wrong. Sometimes, the foreign worlds that the sorcerers visited had laws of nature that were too unique and strange, this resulted in countless demon hunter deaths. As for the reason for their deaths, it often came down to either being killed by some exotic creature that resided in the foreign world or falling into the invisible claws of the incomprehensible and mystifying law of nature and order of the said foreign lands. Several moments later. Boom boom boom. A huge and bulky demon hunter, one who was two meters tall and shrouded in black smog, walked past Grimm. There were several heads of convincing-looking wolves glaring through the dark cloak as a pair of dark red bat wings spread out of the black smog. 
Grimm and Millie could not help but to lay their eyes on the powerful sorcerer for a few more moments before they stepped into the shadow lobby of the Demon Hunter headquarters. The powerful shadowy sorcerer was probably a level 2 sorcerer who possessed the ability to morph his body. Other than that, it would seem that he was also one of the most powerful level 2 sorcerers. Witnessing this power, a tremendous pressure fell upon Grimm, Millie, and several other sorcerers who were behind them. In the meantime, the shadow lobby of the Demon Hunter headquarters had a glowing dark emerald light globe floating in the middle of the side lobby. Various energies filled with mystical vibes hummed solemnly in every corner of the room. Grim and Millie stood in front of the glowing globe as the former calmly read the messages being displayed. Then, Grim whispered, it has only been half a year since the commencement of the conquest and yet there are already over 2,300 dark demon hunters who signed up for the Seven Rings demon hunting missions. If the conquest goes on for a decade, wouldn't there be over tens of thousands of dark demon hunters squeezing into that void fortress? What about the number of bright sorcerers and soul slaves, whose sheer number is several times more than the dark sorcerers? It would seem that even this void fortress, which was amongst the lowest class compared to the others, carried over two million sorcerers from the sorcerer world in its conquest in this foreign world. Of course, most of the passengers were stigmata sorcerers and mere soul slaves. After having understood the rough idea of what was going on, Grimm faced Millie. Millie calmly replied, let's sign the contract. To the stigmata sorcerers, we're just some lowly demon hunters, the convenient tools that they have rented from the Seven Rings. It's like an investment. As for us, the lowly demon hunters, we don't have a say in who'd be our clients. We're just pawns after all. All we can do is wait for those high and mighty stigmata sorcerers to come and pick up our contracts. Grim felt a twitch on his face after hearing Millie's painful but truthful insights. Nonetheless, every sorcerer's views and sentiments of the world were different. This was something that he must admit objectively. Due to his deep passion for the sorcerer world, Grimm did not possess the materialistic and businesslike mentality like Millie. Yet, he did not really want to argue with her about it too. Right. After agreeing with her, Grimm and Millie both rocked up their soul waves and penned their names on the low rank contracts. As they completed their contract binding, an invisible wave rippled in the air as several elemental runes appeared in the sky. Then, as the runes disappeared swiftly without a trace, Grimm and Millie's profiles and crystal ball contacts appeared within the dark emerald glowing globe. After bidding each other farewell, Grimm and Millie stepped out of the shadow lobby and left the area. Millie was headed to the Seven Ring World to visit her little sister Mina while Grimm was going to spend the last of his sorcerer essences to buy basic knowledge about the Chimras. A few moments later, Grimm had arrived at the ingress of life's secrets. As soon as he stepped through the entrance, the first thing Grimm saw was an obscenely awkward-looking pan vine, ensnaring any poor living creature that was unfortunate enough to cross its path. At the same time, there were a few dozen swine-looking creatures screeching in fear as they were fleeing away from the vine creature, yet, they were not fast enough, one by one, they were wrapped up by the creature's vines. The swine creatures were then torn to pieces before being swallowed whole. It was quite a frightening sight. An aura of black shadows was felt throughout the room as this scene unfolded before Grimm. Each of the vine creature's branches was about hundreds of meters in length, they were all highly flexible and soft, like the tentacles of an octopus. Yet, these branches and vines were still wood, they were solid and tough. If paid closer attention, one could also see a layer of black fur on the surface of the branches. Do you want to acquire the basic knowledge of the Chimras or do you wish to trade for the advanced knowledge of reconstructing the Chimras? An elderly sorcerer slowly emerged from the fearsome vine creature's branches, it was as though his torso was ejected out from the branches. He lazily stretched his body while letting out a wide yawn before posing his question at Grimm, who was standing next to the entrance. Grimm could instinctively feel a surge of immense threat as soon as he saw the elderly sorcerer, as though he had met his natural nemesis in the wild. 
Grim's irises quivered and shrunk as he gasped, Black Sorcerer. This threatening dread that Grim was feeling was indeed an instinctive reaction that humans had when facing their natural predators. Black sorcerers were infamous for collecting human despair. It was by doing this they were able to pose an unimaginably tremendous threat to the other sorcerers in the sorcerer world. In the black domain, the world where black sorcerers hailed, ordinary humans were considered slaves and pets for the black sorcerer. Oh, a new demon hunter? I see. So, you're here for the basic knowledge of the Chimras. That'll be ten sorcerer essences. The elderly sorcerer gave Grimm an indifferent glance. Grimm's unusual behavior and reactions were enough for him to see that this greenhorn was a newly ranked up demon hunter. Whoosh! Grimm firmly grabbed the crystal ball, one that was shrouded in black scent, that was hurled at him. After this short moment of exchange, Grimm realized that he was being impolite. Indeed, the sorcerer world did forbid black sorcerers from entering. However, they had now signed a peace treaty with the black domain. Thus, it was quite possible that the two worlds were also on a collaboration of some sorts. This black sorcerer was probably one of the few who were sent to the sorcerer world from the black domain as a result of the two worlds' collaboration. After bowing to portray his sincere apology to the elderly sorcerer, Grimm slashed open a pocket dimension in the air, took out a bundle of sorcerer essences and tossed them to the top of the vine creature. Having completed his trade, Grimm hastily left the ingress of life's secrets. Humans, no matter where their allegiance lay, would always feel a lingering dread around black sorcerers. As for demon hunters like Grimm, they would often strike up a sense of hostility towards them too. After returning to his demon hunter castle, Grimm proceeded to draw his new timetable from scratch. Firstly, he declared that there was no longer any need to resume his intoxication sorcery in the ascetic prison. As a result, he could use the extra time to research on the knowledge regarding Chimras. This should ensure some preliminary breakthrough in Chimra research on the offset of his demon hunting mission. Other than that, Grimm only had 98 mental strength. Although he had not achieved 100 mental strength, the requirement to become a level 1 sorcerer, Grimm had decided that he would stop his daily meditation and pursue more physical training in order to drive out his body's potential, which would increase his combat prowess in battles. Finally, he would also need to ensure that the miner had some combat utilities by matching his curses and long-range teleportation abilities. Little Miner Grimm called for the Miner from his laboratory desk. In the wink of an eye, the Miner leapt out from a reality distortion on his shoulder. Holding a walnut in his beak, the Miner let out an obnoxious laugh, Caw caw, what is thy bidding, my beloved Master Grimm? In the last hundreds of years, the Miner's feathers had grown brighter and more colorful. He even had a small golden ring on one of his talons, giving him an appearance of a noble's exotic pet, this won him a lot of adoration from the ladies too. It's about that thing we've discussed before. How did it go? Grim asked. Caw 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 caw. Oh my beloved Master Grim, don't you worry. On your shoulder now stands the mighty Lord Miner of the Sorcerer World. I'm not like those stupid moronic parrots you find in the woods. Those things you spoke of. There was no need for me to have a hand in it at all. Am, um, my master, what are you glaring at? Come on, stop glaring at me like this. HMPH. Grim gave him a contemptful curt response. I'll give you one more month. If you can't do it, I'll have you retrieve bones back to me for one thousand times. After berating him, Grim turned his attention back to his crystal ball, which was gleaming with gentle rays of light, and continued on with his research on the Chimras. One. One thousand. One thousand times. After shrieking out in horror, the miner was stunned as he stood in place for a short moment of time, then, he quickly flew away in a hurry. Chapter 176 The First Phase of Engineering the Mask of Truth Translator, 
Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. There were four criteria to create a chimera. It required a huge amount of living flesh, a living heart that could go on beating forever, a carcass refinery and an elemental soul. Then, there was also required knowledge for the remodifications and upgrading procedures of a chimera, the basic formulation and remodifications of living flesh, reactive stimulation of a living heart and the synthesis upgrade of an element soul. As for carcass refinery, it was the key to granting life to the chimeras. Carcass refinery was wisdom passed down from the ancient black sorcerers. The means and procedures of the refinery process were mostly left unmodified. In other words, learning how to create a chimera was the same as learning how to differentiate the various materials and components for creating the chimeras and also the different matrix patterns of the carcass refineries. Grimm had seen results of a living flesh formulation and remodifications before the massive remodifications of the Jujulong stone was one such example. As for why one needed to stimulate a living heart, after the host dies, his or her heart would suffer a huge drop in its power output. Thus, the sorcerers would require a higher form of knowledge to stimulate it to pull it back to its full potential. This was what Jolni meant when she traded the living heart with Grimm back then. As for the synthesis technique of the elemental souls, it was a process equivalent to combining and synthesizing several natural elemental souls, upgrading them into one superior entity via artificial means. The collected natural elemental souls can only be used for the synthesizing process once. Therefore, the amount of element souls used was a deciding factor as to whether this sorcery was one of a high grade or not. Unlike the other newly ranked up demon hunters, Grimm had developed his own unique thought process in viewing the knowledge available to him after doing research alone for a long period of time. He had learned to ignore the useless gimmicks that were decorating the surface of any knowledge presented to him. By doing so, he could master new knowledge in a much shorter time. For example, his ways of learning the carcass refinery. To other sorcerers, their priority after acquiring the knowledge was almost always about memoizing every single detail about carcass refinery, the protocol, matrix patterns, literally everything about it. However, the matrix of the carcass refinery had six main energy pillars, 216 reactive energy joints, 7,792 energy intersection flocks, and 3,537994 basic rune inscriptions. That was not all. Amongst all the 353799 basic rune inscriptions, there were about 273,600 runes that required modifications and reprogramming in accordance to the data of the living flesh being used. In short, this was going to be an astronomically massive memory load for any full-fledged sorcerer. Yet, Grimm was different. To Grimm, learning meant reverse-engineering any of the existing carcass refineries, by doing that, he would reorganize, analyze and conclude the rules and laws behind the object of his learning. As such, whenever Grimm needed to formulate a carcass refinery, he only had to analyze the data of the available living flesh and scribe down the 273,600 basic runes, and the work it from there using logical deductions. When all that was done, he could freely create any carcass in a time as he wished. The two ways of learning seem to lead to the same results. However, it's quite easy for one to miss a crucial difference behind this. The former, the memoizing everything technique, only allowed the learners to learn whatever knowledge and techniques that the other sorcerers had discovered. It's a rigid recall and recycle, which contributed nothing new to the literature. The latter, however, utilized one's critical thinking which then enabled the learners to see the bigger picture and the underlying workings under any knowledge presented to them. And thus, the learners not only learned new knowledge, they also get to create their own knowledge. The knowledge that they discovered and create their own could then contribute to the vast literature in the academia of the sorcerer world, allowing more innovations and breakthroughs. It would keep fresh ideas, new discoveries flowing and evolving, like an actual living being. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. A month later.
In the alchemy lab, Grimm couldn't hold his joy as he looked at a completed rune formula on his desk. The first phase of engineering the Mask of Truth was finally done. Even after combining ultrasonic sorcery and mystic eye, the total storage within the Mask of Truth was only expended by 10%. This meant that there was still a huge amount of potential for future development for the mask. If things went according to plan, Grimm could install both Eagle Eye Technique and Boundless Eye Sorcery into the Mask of Truth, developing it further towards its full potential, after returning from his demon hunting mission. Overjoyed, Grimm put down the quill that he used to pen down the last rune earlier and sealed back the various magic ink bottles. Then, he extended his gentle pale hand to reach a weird self-extending paper. Pop! Like a ripple rocking across a calm lake, a surge of magic power pulsed out of Grimm's palm and then, swiftly, the weird paper suddenly was wrapped up into a ball. In less than a second, it morphed into a grey ivory mask, one that could fit onto Grimm's face perfectly. A huge swirling rune was printed on the mask, it was the enchantment for the supersonic sorcery. As soon as Grimm put on the mask of truth, he could feel that the world had changed in an instance. It felt as though there was a thin layer of membrane appeared in between reality and the laws of truth. Everything in the world followed the lead and guidance of various specific rules and laws of nature and reality. Yet, most living beings could only see the surface of this reality and couldn't see through the true laws of truth underneath. Even the wise sorcerers were cursed with the limitations of their senses, all they could only do was to attempt research after research to peek through the veil of reality. The result of that was sorcery. And this all led to Grimm's plan with the Mask of Truth. The mask's purpose was to boost up the sorcerer's own senses, the senses to peek through the various laws of reality, to see the truth behind reality. Thus, the name Mask of Truth. Instinctively, Grimm took out two wooden broken branches. Then, using his calm eyes, as calm as a frozen lake, Grimm calmly stared through the mask of truth. Suddenly, a lightning runed bright iris appeared on the eyes of the mask. The boundless eye function was now activated. Whoosh! Then, the lightning rune scanned at the broken branches in a flash. Yet, in that brief instance, in Grimm's eyes, that swift lightning rune didn't look like any kind of rune to him. It appeared to be a lightning bolt that was moving about on the broken branches. It was like an actual lightning elemental was sipping on the surface of the broken branches with the speed of light. After moving about for a short moment, the lightning bolt stopped at the broken parts of the branches, in a flash, a lightning mirror appeared on the spot and started to glimmer fiercely. As the lightning bolt continued to scan the lightning mirror, Grimm felt as though electric current running through his body. Peaced. What's going on? So, when I was observing the broken branches, I wasn't really acquiring knowledge and wisdom about any lightning runes at all. But rather, it was my soul that was passively responding to and receiving data from the moving lightning bolt. There was a brief moment I could feel that I was absorbing a quarter of whatever data the lightning bolt had acquired. In other words, if I used the boundless eye to scan anything three times, it could save me decades of research as a sorcerer apprentice. As his eyes glimmered with joy and surprise, Grimm continued on with his deduction. So there were several lightning element joints that one could find from these two broken branches. Who knows how many secret joints one could find in there. Yet, there is one thing that's for sure, these lightning joints follow a certain rhythm, a rule, and I'm absorbing data from them. As I am doing that, my body's attributes and elements will start aligning with that certain rule. That means I could turn my body's attribute into the same one as this broken branches whenever the rule of this lightning ascends. Yet, even if I've turned my body to align with this lightning rule, what good would it do for me? Nonetheless, Grimm had never really seen any use of the electric elements found in these broken branches even up to today. If there was a need to find out the deeper workings behind the electric power of these two broken branches, he had two means to do it. 
He could perform experiments after experiments, like the ancient sorcerers, to acquire results through sheer luck. Or, he could study the energy source and foundation of this lightning rule, and then deduce out its use. Yet no matter the outcome, it was a must for Grimm to absorb the energy and data from them and change his body's attributes to uncover the secrets behind these two broken branches. Grimm couldn't imagine just how many years he would need to acquire data from the lightning joints without the aid of the boundless eye. He might need tens of thousands of years, perhaps even hundreds of thousands of years. Only the great necromancers possessed the longevity to make such observation. Without the power of being a full-fledged sorcerer, or leveled-up stigmata or great necromancer, there's no way one soul could live on for over an era and be functional enough to make such observation. That's the balance of nature for all things in the world. And an era in the sorcerer world was 10,000 years about 43,800,000 hourglass time. A moment later. Minor. Grim yelled out loudly. In less than a second, the colorful flashy miner leapt out of a blob of reality warp appeared on Grimm's shoulder. Master Grimm. Don't you know it's utmost impolite to disturb a great mighty parrot's afternoon nap? You ought to know that, ahem, what is thy bidding? After seeing the bone in Grimm's palm, Miner immediately behaved as it reminded him of a certain painful memory. Grimm turned and looked at Miner. Caw 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 caw. Trying to glaze through the awkward moment, Miner spoke as he pointed at Grimm's mask of truth, Caw Caw. Oh my, my beloved Master Grimm had finally finished the first phase of engineering the mask of truth. Congratulations! Oh, I can totally see Master Grimm's unique taste and innovation, it's quite obvious that this is a huge revolutionary work of art in the sorcerer world. Look at it. The mysterious and yet surreal aura around it. Oh my, I couldn't help but be amazed by it after seeing it with my small and unimportant eyes. Can you see that? The color, the engravings, oh, it's like the work of God. Fifteen minutes later, Miner was out of words as he felt his throat was dried up from speaking so much. Grim finally spoke, are you finally done? If you're done with your asterisk SS kissing, I need you to fly to the life tree and do what I asked of you earlier. HMPH, if you don't produce any result, you know what consequences await. After receiving a stern glare from Grimm, Miner swiftly zoomed out of the window. Miner was always speedy in flying, his flight speed was even faster than Grimm. Grimm had always wondered how this little thing flew so fast. An hourglass time later. Using his long-range teleportation spell, Grimm's face was turning dingy as he looked at the life tree that was still far away. The teleportation could only send him to an area halfway between his demon hunter castle and the life tree. It was most probably that this darn parrot had forgotten to add in some decimals when calculating the coordinates, and thus he was sent to this spot after departing from his original coordinates. HMPH. So, his small brain and soul had limited his ability to make simple calculations too. A brief moment later, Miner leapt out of a reality distortion bubble and landed on Grimm's shoulder. Ah! One month! Come on, just give me one more month! You're beautiful, noble, loyal, pure, sincere, gentle, kind little Miner will definitely produce the result you want. Looking at the bone that Grimm was about to toss out, Miner's face turned pale almost immediately Grimm was aiming to toss the bone at the life tree, where a lot of sorcerers were gathering at. If he were to retrieve the bone while barking like a dog in front of so many, Miner's precious reputation would all be ruined. Pulling back his arm, Grimm shot a glare at Miner on his shoulder. After a long moment of silence, Grimm replied sternly, sure. I'll give you one more month. If you can't do it in a month, you'll need to retrieve the bone one thousand times like a dog. After that, Grimm furiously flew back to the demon hunter castle. As he looked at Grimm flew to a great distance away from him in the sky, Miner finally snapped. This damned Grimm beast. 
Don't you forget me, the Lord Miner, devoured your soul fire prime back then. How dare you speak to me like this? This little prick. If I get really pissed, I could just go ahead and gulp down a bottle of poison. I'll drag you down to the pit of death with me. Oh poor me. I, Lord Miner, returned to this endless world to live a lavish life, not to be tortured like this, you darn summoned grim beast. You think I, the great Lord Miner, will obey you? One day you'll be like that old twat too, become my servant's materials. If you've got the balls, don't use this stupid bone trick or some dimensional spell, don't. Chapter 177, An Honorable Death. Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Eight years later. Gritting his teeth, Grimm slowly walked along a narrow path that led to the Demon Hunter Castle. Unlike the others who relied on mental strength, Grimm's advantage lay in his sturdier constitution. While the others only had to keep on doing meditation to maintain their magical power at the same level as their mental strength, Grimm needed to train every cell in his body, utilize every ounce of his strength and vitality to push his magical power to be at the same level as his constitution level. Huff, puff, huff. Although highly unlikely, Grimm, an anatomy refinery sorcerer with high constitution was exerting so much effort just to walk. It seemed so impossible and unimaginable. Yet, that was what was happening. If one were to observe in closer detail, one could see that Grimm was carrying a massive and heavy alloy, one that was created from alchemy. These alloys were materials used to construct the void ships, and Grimm was now putting these on his back. Nonetheless, despite having these on his back, with Grimm's high constitution, it was still quite difficult to make him struggle this much as he walked to his destination. The real reason that was causing him so much trouble in moving about was the constant gravitational pull from the Terran stream. This essentially multiplied the weight Grimm had to carry as he moved about. Hence the reason Grimm was struggling so much to walk towards his destination. In the sky, there was a pair of sorcerer spouse who spotted him and threw him a glance. Ignoring them, Grimm lowered his head and continued pushing on towards his destination. His robe was now totally soaked by his sweat as it clung onto his muscular body, his chest was rapidly rising as he panted for air. Next to the narrow road, paved by small white stone pallets, that he was journeying on there was a long man-made river. Schools of fish were happily swimming about in the gushing water reflecting each of Grimm's struggling steps. Oh? Good morning. We meet again. An old sorceress, who was walking two pet pigs with two ropes tied to their collars, greeted Grimm. The two pet pigs were about twenty centimeters in length, snorting through their long noses, the pigs showed off their white glossy hides while waving their curly tails. Oh, such lovely creatures. Under the setting sun, the massive shadow of the Tree of Life was slowly moving away from Grimm's long slender shadow. HMPH. Nodding his head in acknowledgement of the bright sorcerer, Grimm dipped his head and continued on, passing her by. Two large sweat drops rolled down from his forehead to his jaw, and then dripped onto the stone pallet below him. Hum. Leading her two cute happy little pigs, the bright sorcerer resumed her evening walk. A moment later. Hey, Grim. I've come to accompany you again. Aren't you glad? Claudia said as she approached Grim with a cheerful smile. She was clad in a revealing scarlet, greenish dress, one that half covered her private part while still presenting her exquisitely feminine voluptuous figure. A mysterious golden necklace hid mischievously in the cleavage that was in between her two huge snowy melons, a rather inviting sight yet leaving a lot of room for lustful imagination. Plus, that wasn't all. Even though she was speaking in a rather seductive tone, her face looked serene like a goddess, one whom no one would dare to violate. What a nymph! Thud thud thud. The thuds that Claudia's stiletto heels made echoed around Grimm as a whiff of alluring body fragrance lingered around him, tempting his olfactory senses. 
Not uttering a single word, Grimm continued on with his difficult journey like a camel crossing a massive desert, not entertaining anything else that was moving in the world. He kept on pushing forward as he panted heavily for fresh air. An hourglass later. Looking at the empty narrow road, Claudia mumbled to herself, it would seem that this isn't the usual dimensional sorcery that they had taught during the Sorcerer Apprentice era. It appears that he's researching a higher level of dimensional knowledge. Claudia shook her head as she pondered upon this thought. Then, she leaped up to the sky and flew back to her demon hunter castle. Back at Grimm's demon hunter castle, Grimm stood in the bathroom quietly as boiling water splashed on his muscular body. Owing to his sturdy elemental resistance, the boiling water was not able to cause him any damage at all. As steam rolled around him, Grimm's body was finally able to relax. Hem? Suddenly, Grimm took out his crystal ball and read the message that was glowing in it. Then, he mumbled to himself, Shadow World. It's been nine years since the Void Fortress sent a team over. So, the demon hunting team is about to complete its task, huh? This time I'll be signing the contract with three stigmata sorcerers, so achieving victory in the shadow world shouldn't be much of an issue. Beep beep beep. Millie's communication signal was beeping through the crystal ball. Without any hesitation, Grimm fueled up magical power into his crystal ball to establish communication as he hastily threw on his clothes. Grimm, how's your preparation? The shadow world. From the looks of it, this is a world that has a different set of laws and rules from the sorcerer world. I'm hoping that the environment there isn't too harsh to handle. Millie stated, sounding worried. Grimm replied with a frown, the contract has been signed. We don't have much choice. If things went on as usual, the demon hunters would normally spend half a month to comprehend the rules and laws of the new world while preparing and analyzing the specimens from the world's habitants in the Void Fortress. The stigmata sorcerers would usually provide a huge amount of data, information, and specimens of the habitants of the world they're conquering. Let's do more preparation when the time comes. Yeah. Nodding her head, Millie continued on with her inquiry, what about your soul slaves? I've met with a few complications here. I've got two dead soul slaves here that I am not able to resupply in time. Snap. After snapping his fingers, for black-scaled humanoids, each one and a half meters in height, appeared behind Grimm. He calmly replied, I've remodified these things using hematology sorcery and a unique technique. Their combat prowess should be enough to handle low-level legendary knights that are modified via hematology sorcery. They can each deal 150 damage. They also possess a great amount of health points. Hum, let's call them gals. Raw. The four gals let out a roar in unison as they extended their black batwings. Tiny rays of violet energy radiated out from their mouths as dark green venom gushed out from their claws. Oh? They look great. Could you sell me two of these? I'll let you decide the price so long as the trade's not in sorcerer essences. Millie asked, overjoyed with the prospect of buying the gals. Grim replied, certainly. I still have three of these as spares. I'll send two over after this. All right, give me three hourglasses to seal my lab. Then, we'll head to the Dark Sorcerer's headquarters. All right. Millie cut off communication after giving a curt reply. The Shadow World, huh? Grim pondered deeply as he stepped towards his lab. Then, he began to seal his tools while also stowing other tools that he might need for his demon hunting mission into the dimensional gap. Kor Kor, my beloved Master Grim, is there a reply for the demon hunting mission? You're leaving, the miner stood on a chandelier above Grim as he posed his question for his master. While still packing up his items, Grim replied, yes. It's a world called the Shadow World. You ought to make preparations too. Oh, what's there for this lone parrot to prepare for though? Well, 
seeing that we might be gone for a hundred to two hundred years, perhaps it's best that I bid my farewell to the little Angelus. Then, the parrot spread his wings and flew towards Angelus Demon Hunter Castle. Two hourglasses later. Grimm sat on the sofa in the middle of his lobby, checking to see if he had left anything behind. A few minutes later, Grimm, who had done all his preparations and was ready to depart, saw his Norse slave working hard at cleaning the chambers. The old Norse spine was so disjointed that its body was almost curved to the floor. Its thin and weak body wielded its broom shakily as it gasped for air. Its green skin was wrinkled to a knob, showing very little vigor and vitality. Grim could see that the old Nor did not have long to live it could, at best, live for another two to three years. As though noticing Grim's gaze, the Nor raised its head and looked at Grim with its lifeless eyes and asked with its sore voice, Master. Grim then was stunned as he noticed something. He could not believe he had completely forgotten about this Nor. Soul slaves were valuable in fact, more valuable than some tools for experiments. He almost made the mistake of not retrieving a prized soul fire. After a brief chant, Grimm waved his hand at the Nor. Then, a green flame, invisible to ordinary mortal eyes, flew out of the body of the Nor and then fused into Grimm's body. Weakened and frail, the old Nor then fell to the floor together with the broom. Master. Even though it was now free from the soul fire's control, there was no thought of rebellion residing within the old Norse mind. All that it could do now was to look at Grimm with its teary eyes. Seeing the tears in its eyes, Grimm recalled the two hundred years' worth of memories they spent together in his demon hunter castle. Feeling a ripple of emotion surface in his heart, Grimm lowered his hand, forfeiting the idea of decommissioning this material that had already reached the end of its use with a fireball. Due to the total control bestowed upon them, sorcerers would usually not have any emotional attachment to their soul slaves, much like how humans would not care for their mechanical slaves too. Yet, these soul slaves were not machines. They were living beings that possessed feelings and a livelihood. The only difference between them and living beings was that they were controlled by the sorcerers via the domination of their souls. Even though at first glance one would think that the sorcerer had full control of the soul slaves' bodies and minds, these slaves could still feel emotions. Despite being alive, they could only watch their bodies act based on their master's wills instead of theirs. Having forfeited the thought of killing this useless soul slave leftover, Grimm decided to grant its final days some peaceful grace. After tossing a few magic stones and a bottle of medicine to it, Grimm calmly told the Nor, After I leave, treat this castle as your home. I've saved a piece of land in the backyard for you, you can bury yourself there when the time comes. Clack! The castle's wooden door shut tight as Grimm took his leave. Chapter 178 Shadow World Conquest I Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation. Whoosh! Whoosh! Grim and Millie landed at the Dark Sorcerer's headquarters together. This time, they did not land on the ground in front of the headquarters, instead, they flew straight to the open space plaza on top of the building. By the time they arrived, there were already over 20,000 dark demon hunters gathered at the plaza. They could see more dark sorcerers flying towards the plaza from afar too. Grim and Millie picked a less congested area in the plaza and observed the other fellow demon hunters quietly. Judging from what he could see, Grim observed that the level 1 sorcerers and level 2 sorcerers numbers were about 15 to 1 in ratio. In other words, there were less than 2,000 level 2 sorcerers who could morph their bodies into elements, out of the 20,000 people in the plaza. As for the level 3 sorcerers, it was quite rare to see a level 3 sorcerer under the defensive cover of the Seven Rings. Thus, it was even less likely to see one showing up in a demon hunting mission. This was due to the policies of the sorcerer world that encouraged dark sorcerers to run experiments and meditations for an obscenely huge amount of time, this, 
in turn, was to encourage them to rank up to be stigmata sorcerers so they could reinforce and enhance the strength of the sorcerer world itself. Other than that, level 3 sorcerers were too busy with various duties and tasks. Therefore, their services would only be required when peculiar missions or tasks surfaced. For example, the task of becoming a sorcerer school, or to audit conquered worlds, or to repress and squelch rebellions, or to determine the coordinates of a potentially conquerable world before demon hunting missions could be commenced, or to maintain the Holy Tower's security system. If level 1 and level 2 sorcerers of the sorcerer world were mere foot soldiers and elite privates in an army, then the level 3 sorcerers were the ones who possessed the opportunity to become sergeants and majors in the army, the ones with leadership roles. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Several dozens of agile moving mirror images dropped from the sky and hovered steadily in front of everyone present in the plaza. After taking a closer look, these were actually huge mechanical bee mounts. Grimm saw one of these flying mounts, used by the Sky Holy Tower sorcerer apprentices, back when he was riding the giant turtle of Celestial Cordillera to the world core. Millie, though, was taken aback when she saw these massive bees, it would seem that she had never seen these flying mounts before. Unshaken by the sudden appearance of the flying mounts, Grimm started to make deductions. He was curious about the origins of these bees, were they part of the Void Fortress's facilities or were they specifically assigned by the Holy Towers to carry the Dark Sorcerers into the Void Fortress? If they were part of the Void Fortress's facilities, that would mean that these agile flying bees were meant to be the Elite Field Sorcerers mounts. The Elite Field Sorcerers were demon hunters who had earned honor badges by delivering outstanding performances in their missions. Their honor badges were categorized by ranks, rank 3, rank 2, rank 1, and rank superior. They were the best of the best amongst the demon hunters, thus, they were granted more resources, privileges, and status compared to the ordinary demon hunters. These mechanical bees could, at most, carry 10 people. After they were at maximum capacity, they zoomed up to the sky, leaving a vivid mirror image behind at the plaza. Their flight speed was so fast that they rose up higher than the Seven Rings' defensive cover and clouds in less than a minute. In just minutes, these mechanical bees had completed their first round and flew right back to the plaza with empty seats, and then, another batch of dark sorcerers boarded and were also sent straight to their destination. Grimm and Millie sat close together as the mechanical bees' unthinkable speed broke away from the gravitational pull of the Terran stream. Several sorcerers who had weaker stamina started to feel sick as they reached higher altitudes, to remain conscious, they needed to activate their defensive barriers or techniques to counteract the sheer inertia that was pressing on them. Grimm was not affected much by this due to his sturdy constitution. With his mystic eye activated, Grimm was studying the bee's mechanical gears that were spinning rapidly next to the window. This, this is such an interestingly curious mechanical design. Even though he was not familiar with machines, Grimm was able to observe the workings of the complex machine using his mystic eye. Astounded by what he saw, Grimm let out a sigh of amazement. Poof! After passing through the defensive cover and penetrating layers after layers of snowy clouds, the mechanical bee finally reached a serenely quiet dimension. As though there was a layer of steam cloaked above the clouds, the place looked misty and surreal. This dimension was what they called the vacant in the sorcerer world a vacuum of nothingness except for elemental energies. Buzz buzz buzz. Rapidly buzzing its mechanical wings, the massive mechanical bee hovered in place as it adjusted the position and angle it was heading towards. The seats within were also slowly turning to face forward instead of upwards. Then, in a flash, the mechanical bee zoomed towards a massive scarlet metallic structure leaving yet another mirror image from where it was hovering earlier. After traveling for half a second, a powerful sonic boom blasted around the bee, rippling the clouds below. From afar, Grimm, Millie, and the other passengers could see the scarlet red moon ahead of them. 
They could also see three more identical moons suspended in the air on other sides too. There were a total of four scarlet moons hanging above the clouds of the holy tower of the seven rings. As the mechanical bees flew closer to the void fortress, the metallic structure was so massive that Grimm was not able to see it in its entirety. On the contrary, he was now finally able to see the details of parts of the fortress now that they had inched closer. The war machine of the sorcerer world, the void fortress. It looked like a gigantic hemispheric metallic flying megastructure. This metallic megastructure was approximately 12,000 meters in length, its foundation was supported by countless of scarlet metal pallets, serving as a heat sink for the massive hemispheric fortress. Each of these metal pallets was hundreds of meters in length, the spaces in between these pallets were huge too, enough to accommodate one of the mechanical bees that Grimm was riding on at the moment. Getting a rough measure with his bare eyes, Grimm was amazed as he realized that each of these scarlet metallic pallets were at least five meters thick. Standing on top of these scarlet pallets were gigantic metallic doors which opened up as they flew closer. Other than the approaching mechanical bees, there were also several 300-meter-long void ships, shaped like sharks, flying through the doors. As they got closer, mechanical arms rose from within the doors and grabbed the void ships, pulling them into the lower part of the fortress. The lower part of the fortress too had about 20 massive metallic doors. They could see numerous snail emissaries escorting multiple flying creatures that were approaching the void fortress. At a closer look, one could see that there were huge numbers of bright sorcerers riding on top of these creatures. Virum. Virum. On top of the Tree of Life's energy ring, the heart of the Seven Rings was floating and hovering in place at the vacant as it lifted several void ships to the void fortress. The seemingly quiet clouds were in fact drift with bustling action as everyone scrambled to direct the incoming flying vessels into the fortress. Amongst the landing vessels was Grimm and Millie's mechanical bee, which landed firmly on a wide open space within the void fortress. When looking around, one could see a sorcerer tower standing near where they landed, other than that, there were also several visible entrances that led to the lower part of the void fortress. As the vessels settled down on their landing porches, the bright and dark sorcerers were directed off of their transports before they were grouped into two massive groups. The bright sorcerer's group was several times the size of the dark sorcerer's. After lining up in an orderly fashion at the landing porches, one could see that there was barely any space in between each of these bright sorcerer's shoulders. After they had settled down, they were led into the deeper parts of the fortress to receive their assignments. As for the dark sorcerers, due to their smaller numbers they each had a huge space in between them after lining up at the landing porches. Unlike the bright sorcerers, no one displayed much emotion nor had any communication with one another. All they did was calmly and placidly wait for their next instructions. Three hourglasses later. Every single bright sorcerer had now marched into the deeper parts of the void fortress, leaving only the dark sorcerers standing calmly waiting for their assignments. Having completed their duty as transports, the mechanical bees flew back into the basement of the void fortress. Suddenly, a huge black dimensional crater, about several dozens of meters in length, was being torn open in the sky. Whoosh whoosh whoosh. Hundreds of dark silhouettes then emerged from the huge black crater and landed on the void fortress. A large of number of these newcomers leaped straight into the deeper areas of the void fortress while only a small number of them landed on the landing zone. Grim could feel a powerful demon hunter aura from these newcomers. They were all level 3 sorcerers. Nonetheless, the other demon hunters did not pay much attention to them. They were still raising their heads, looking at the black dimensional crater that was still open in the sky. Realizing something, Grim and Millie too shifted their attention to the dimensional crater. Slowly, three humanoid sorcerer-looking silhouettes emerged from within the crater. In an instance, the demon hunters in the void fortress started to breathe heavily, admiration glimmered in their eyes as they looked at the three sorcerers above. They were the great stigmata sorcerers of the sorcerer world. 
crack crack crack. Yet, the three stigmata sorcerers, who are at most two meters in height, appeared to be stuck on the other side of the dimensional crater, which was at least several dozens of meters in length, and could not get through into the void fortress. This puzzled many low-level sorcerers who were present. Grimm quietly deduced what was going on. Perhaps it's the incompatibility of the energy used. Or perhaps it's the nature's law that's in the way. Wait, could it be that this is due to a miscalculation in the relative dimension when tearing open the crater? Or a miscalculation of the temporal flux? It was then several dozens of seven rings snail emissaries appeared around the black dimensional crater. These snail emissaries then started to move around the black crater, gnawing up the space around it. Slowly, the black dimensional crater became bigger and bigger, turning into a massive round-shaped dimensional hole. A quarter of an hour later, a massive round-shaped dimensional hole, over hundreds of diameters in size, was fully formed above the void fortress. Finally, the three stigmata sorcerers started to slowly step out of the dimensional hole. Each step they took was very cautious, as if they were afraid to ruin anything in the process. As the stigmata sorcerers completely materialized into the sorcerer world, the seven ring snail emissaries shot out surges after surges of energy waves from their mouths, mending the dimensional hole in a rather short period of time. As countless demon hunters looked at the three stigmata sorcerers hovering above the massive void fortress, overlooking everyone below, they felt as if their hearts had gotten a tight squeeze, causing them to hold their breaths in awe. There were three massive dark shadowy silhouettes, over a hundred meters in size, standing behind the three ordinary-looking stigmata sorcerers. Despite doing their best to observe, no one was able to see clearly what these giants were. And yet, a powerful pressure, an existential level of pressure caused each of the demon hunters' hearts to quiver. Chapter 179, Shadow World Conquest 2 Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation The three stigmata sorcerers did not seem like they intended to land on the void fortress. Suddenly, the thirty over level three dark sorcerers tensed up and activated a surge of powerful magical power as the many level one and level two dark sorcerers had their eyes stuck on the whole process unfolding before them. Then, countless crystal balls that contained various details about the shadow world's laws of nature and inhabitant specimens were conjured out of thin air. A quarter of an hourglass later, Grim and Millie each received a crystal ball and a pig like creature which was half a meter in length, as specimens. Excited, they focused all their attention on the crystal balls first rather than the inhabitant specimens that were being paralyzed by galvanic chains. After fueling them with magical power, images started to glimmer in the crystal balls. The images showed a world that was quite peculiar. Burning hot sand, rock and smoke-fuming volcanoes could be seen everywhere. The sun was so hot that it seemed to have scorched the land into a layer of coal, no grass was seen on any patch of land shown in the crystal ball. On top of that, night never fell in this world. Grimm was utterly puzzled. So, this was the shadow world. What happened? What caused this world to have to suffer such a harsh set of laws of nature? An eternal daylight. How? Why? Interested, Grimm patiently waited and listened to the introductory briefing from the crystal ball. Over 70% of the shadow world shown in the crystal ball were nothing but scorched barren lands. It was almost like the boundless ocean in the sorcerer world even though it was the biggest part of the world, the ocean was not a suitable habitat for the world's dominant ruling species to live in. On top of the scorched lands, there were volcanoes that fumed thick layers of black smog. The smog gathered in the sky in differing intensities and sizes, covering the scorching sun in the sky. This in turn cast shades and shadows of various sizes onto the vast land below, thus the name Shadow World. The areas where the shadows constantly covered were safe from the deadly burning rays of the sun, therefore, these were the only places that any living being, with flesh and blood, could live. 
Each of these was, essentially, an oasis for these living creatures. According to the Crystal Ball's images, there were three massive patches of shaded lands, twelve medium-sized shaded lands and 164 smaller shaded lands. Of course, there were also other even smaller shaded areas but their sizes were so minute that they were considered irrelevant. Residing in these shaded lands were the dominant species of the shadow world the Amonros. There were two types of Amonros, categorized by their skin colors, the Golden Amonros and Enigmatic Amonros. Golden Amonros make up 99% of the Amonro population in the shadow world, yet, they were ruled by the 1% of enigmatic Amonros. Golden Amonros were like the other foreign lands creatures, they had undergone passive flesh-based evolution. In that long process of evolution, a small group of elite Golden Amonros learned how to utilize elemental energy, the primary elemental energy that they had mastered was the fire element. As for the enigmatic Amonros, they were the noble families of the Amonro species. There were limited information and intel about these enigmatic Amonros though. The crystal balls only recorded their innate gifts of possessing powerful physical strength and being able to use a certain ability called the enigmatic seal. The records were highly vague, it would seem that the sorcerers who recorded this information did not get to have any sort of interaction with the enigmatic Amonros. The next segment of the images shown was the prized resources in the Shadow World. These resources were discovered by the specialists sent from the Sorcerer World. These resources were then categorized by them according to their utility and rarity. The one that was ranked first was a peculiar kind of flame called the Viduria Flame. It possessed the ability to grant any living being that had a constitution of lower than 100 a unique physical attribute named Viduriarian after a hundred-year process of conversion. This would, in turn, grant the said living being an obscenely sturdy resistance against fire. According to recorded experiments, any fire element that was lower than 1000 degrees Celsius would not cause any damage whatsoever to the host with the Viduriarian trait. After viewing this information, Grimm's eyes were burning with excitement and passion. He had never heard of any exquisite material that could grant living beings the immunity and resistance to fire that was lower than 1000 degrees Celsius. Yet, when there were pros there would always be cons, such was the way of the law of balance in the endless world. There must be a catch behind this great advantage of fire resistance that Viduria flame granted. Maybe it would require some other resources to form the reaction needed for the conversion. Nonetheless, Grimm's constitution was now already over 100. Thus, he was not able to acquire this Viduriarian trait anymore. The resource ranked second were the enigmatic stones and the intel about their enigmatic seal. However, according to the pilot studies of the recording sorcerer, if a sorcerer wanted to utilize the enigmatic seal one would require a certain physical trait that the enigmatic Amonros possessed. Other than that, there were also other conditions one needed to meet to use the power of the enigmatic seal, and the two most important conditions were the enigmatic stones and certain laws of nature surrounding the shadowy smog of the shadow world. Then, the third one on the list was a kind of plant life called camphorigate. These plants were often found underground, extending in great lengths in various underground tunnels. These could be used as strategic resources in battles. As for the fourth resource, it was a kind of stone called the combustors. Combustors were plentiful in the shadow world. These stones possessed high level of fire element energy, and one could find obscene numbers of these stones at the volcanoes. However, the Amonros did not seem to pay much attention to these high-energy stones. As for the fifth resource. Reading about these few dozens of prized resources, Grimm could not help but feel excited. Even if he did not really need these resources for his research, Grimm could also sell these on the markets of the sorcerer world at a good price. Now, the next thing on the list. Grimm lowered his head and looked at the Amonro specimen that was being bound by galvanic chains. This was a golden Amonro. Covered in golden fur, the creature was only half a meter in height. 
Its appearance looked like a plump spherical little pig with a flexible two-meter tail. Grimm observed the creature and began his analysis. From the looks of it, this Amonro was an adult. Its total height was 62 centimeters, its head was 10 centimeters in length, hinting at a seemingly small brain size. Its nose and ears were quite sensitive and well-developed while its skin possessed great resistance and vitality. Nonetheless, Grimm needed to perform a few experiments to determine the extent of its eyes and ears' functionalities. As for the creature's unusually long tail, this thing was surprisingly flexible and sturdy. Perhaps to the Amonros, this tail worked the same way as humans' hands and mantis cutters, it could serve as the means for utility and offense. Next, Grimm observed its reproductive organ. It would appear that the Amonros possessed gender and reproductive capabilities, and their reproductive system was fairly well developed too. According to the crystal ball, this golden Amonro was an ordinary Amonro that did not have much of a social status. Its constitution was around 23, much higher than the ordinary humans in the sorcerer world. Nonetheless, the Amonro's constitution was at a mere lower average level when compared to the demon hunters. As for the enigmatic seal, this sealing technique was not one that required the use of dimensional knowledge. Thus, Grimm and the miner would be able to deter them with their dimensional-related gifts. As he finished up with his analysis, Grimm looked to his side, Millie was still observing the inhabitant specimen that she received earlier on. Moments later, Grimm and Millie traded their inhabitant specimens to research further on the Amonros. Then, they drew their conclusions based on the data and intel they obtained from the Golden Amonro race before they swapped the specimens with the other dark sorcerers who were present at the landing porches. This was to see if they could replicate similar results and conclusions from observing the other specimens in order to generalize the findings to the greater population of the samples. After making observations on the outside appearance of the Amonros, it was time to observe the inner workings of the creatures. To do so, they would need to dissect them and acquire information about the Amonro's organs, run tests on their nervous systems, observe the organic growth system, and simulate psyche reaction to despair. Of course, some sorcerers had their own unique ways of running these observations on their specimens. According to the findings of dissection, Grimm found out that the golden Amonro's most unique feature was their long flexible tail. As for the organs, these were some of the fundamental procedures that they had learned when they were apprentices so there was not much to be said. As for the test runs for the nervous system, this was one of Grimm's fortes, as such, this was not much of an issue for him. After that, he needed to observe the creature's organic growth. Each sorcerer had their own way of running the observation according to their own specialties. Grimm's method was to run microbial observation on the creature's cells a little different from many who liked to peek into the creature's souls or gauge their energy levels. Out of all the procedures, they left the simulation of psyche reaction to despair to be the last segment. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Half a month later. After exchanging data and intel they acquired from the specimen dissections, Grimm and Millie fell into deep thought. Grimm had learned a great deal about the Amonros from his research. His findings were mainly on deductions on the food chain of the Shadow World, Amonros' evolutions, and their elemental weaknesses. It was quite clear that the sorcerers who were masters of ice, water, and poison would be able to cause great damage to the Amonros. Amonros, despite their sturdy fire resistance and great energy in the fire element, were not resistant to ice, water, and poison. Nonetheless, one ought to also be wary of the Amonro's superior regenerative and berserk abilities. These were Grimm's findings after running tests on their cells and organs. When one looked at the features of the Amonro's stomach, it was deducible that these creatures were omnivores. In fact, their diet was even more varied than that of humans, other than meat and plants, the Amonros could also digest energy minerals. Thus, these creatures were much more resilient than humans. Other than that, they were also three times more competent in terms of reproduction than humans. 
they only needed 10 years to grow into adults, adjusting their bodily constitution according to the environment around them. Thus, with ample food and the right environment, these creatures could multiply in numbers in a relatively short amount of time. Then, judging from their skins, they preferred habitats that were dark and shady. As for their need for water. Looking at Grimm, Millie could not help but be impressed by him and feel ashamed of herself. For when they were exchanging information about their specimens, all she could do was listen to whatever findings that Grimm had acquired. His observations and findings were so thorough, conclusive, and logical, surpassing Millie's own findings in every way, and she acquired most of her research skills from her beloved father's lab too. Thus, Millie was utterly impressed by Grimm's display of intelligence in his research. It was as expected from the top sorcerer apprentice, who passed the nightmarish Holy Tower qualification battle. If Grimm were to survive in his journey for the next thousands of years, Millie was sure that this sorcerer would one day rise to be a new MVP amongst the Seven Rings demon hunters. So, my little sister was right after all. He is a genius, much more intelligent than any other ordinary sorcerer, but... Millie then let out a sigh and thought, but it's due to this very reason, perhaps we could never walk the same path as him. If we do, he'll grow so quickly that we'll be entirely left behind. And he'll not even look back to check on us. Chapter 180, Shadow World Conquest 3 Translator, Endless Fantasy Translation Editor, Endless Fantasy Translation In the half a month that followed, the three stigmata sorcerers did not move an inch at all above the Void Fortress. Grimm and Millie were those of the last dark sorcerers to have completed their autopsies on the Amonro specimens on the Void Fortress landing porches. After they had finished putting away their experiment tools and collecting simulated despair, the three stigmata sorcerers finally slowly descended from the sky. After the process of collecting despair was completed, the force of nature that was being linked to the souls started to shift a little. From the looks of it, Grimm might need to bring around 0.1 degree of despair along whenever he needed to hull sorcery attacks at the Amonros. To the Amonros, the demon hunters who usually collected their despair were the black sorcerers native to the Shadow World. On the Void Fortress, there were only several dozens of thousands of dark sorcerers, thus, this left a lot of space for each one of them to stretch their limbs a little. As they raised their heads, they saw the three great stigmata sorcerers descending from the sky. All three of them were female. The one who was hovering in the middle appeared to be the dominant leader. She wore a white pointed mage hat on her head while carrying a long magic staff that was radiating azure light. Flapping a pair of mystical green wings that appeared to be made out of pure energy and light, she scanned all the sorcerers who were gathered on the landing zone with a pair of stunning bright eyes behind her short elegant black hair. The aura of her great wisdom was constantly brimming out of her as she slowly descended towards the sorcerers. Everyone on the landing zone held their breath as they looked on awaiting orders from the great stigmata sorcerers. The leading stigmata sorcerer's voice rippled across the landing zone and into each sorcerer's ears, her voice was calm and elegant, yet she still remained sagacious. Oh dear respected and powerful demon hunters, I welcome all of you in pursuing the same path as I, together, we will march into our illustrious conquest and spread the sorcerer civilization and its wisdom to every corner of this savage shadow world. I am Harkening Whisperer. These two here are my friends and allies, the Great Tomb Segja and Tomb of Ara. Then, Harkening Whisperer waved her staff in the air and, in a flash, thousands of bright little starlights descended from the sky. As a serene invisible wave rippled through the air, every demon hunter felt as though a series of water-dripping sounds calmly sounded in their ears. It was quite common for the sorcerer world to use a rather noble cause as their excuse to invade other worlds. This was to show that it was a civilization that was far more superior than the savage worlds it was conquering. It was always about spreading wisdom, civilizing the uncivilized, igniting hope, saving lost souls, teaching logic and morals to the illogical and immoral, expanding the glory of the sorcerer civilization. 
Needless to say, every civilization had their own methods of warfare. Yet, if it was for the other notable civilizations, they would never waste so much energy in giving so many pointless excuses to justify their invasion of the weaker smaller worlds, all they would do was just kill and plunder. The Stigmata Sorcerers got their titles from the Sorcerer Towers, in which they inherited or developed. Like the master of the Black Isota Tower, his title was the Black Isota. Although Tomb Segja and Tomb Avara possessed titles that were almost identical to one another, they were two different Stigmata Sorcerers who displayed different styles. Tomb Segja wore a chromatic bell tiara on her head while having her eyes covered by a red ribbon. Her long slender elf-like ears were hidden beneath her thick long emerald hair, which dangled softly around her waist. A layer of white mist fogged around the fabric that she wore, giving an impression that the mist was her soft long silky scarf. Tumavara, on the other hand, wore a metal helmet on her head as she glared with her cold eyes from within. Clad in a finely crafted full armor with four long swords on her back, her slender body constantly radiated rays of menacing crimson aura, like moving strings on a harp. After nodding their heads in acknowledgement of the dark sorcerers, Tomb Segja and Tomb of Vow both, without uttering a word, flew straight into the depths of the void fortress, leaving hearkening Whisperer alone in the sky. O oh great sorcerers, bring forth the illustrious flame from the sorcerer world and light up this poor savage world. The evil, heartless, dark, savage civilizations shall all one day be cleansed by the great illustrious flame of our great civilization. O oh respectable demon hunters, bring forth your wisdom and power as you light up this shadow world of savages. This poor uncivilized immoral land needs our saving. As Harkening Whisperer delivered her words of fiery passion, the void fortress suddenly quaked violently as though the massive metallic structure had slowly been awakened. Looking at every demon hunter in the landing zone, Harkening Whisperer continued on with her speech in a solemn tone. I, Harkening Whisperer from the Sorcerer World's Holy Tower of Seven Rings, now declare that the forces of Harkening Whispering Tower will begin its conquest on the Shadow World. Our conquest will obey the laws of the Sorcerer Civilization and the Holy Tower of Seven Rings. I pledge to the heart of the Sorcerer World that I will give it my all to ensure the survival of every respectable demon hunter in their quest to bring this savage world the hope of civilization. Suddenly, one of the laws of nature of the sorcerer world was initiated. Hem. Grim could feel that as Harkening Whisperer announced her pledge, the great void fortress suddenly came alive, as though the stigmata sorcerer's pledge had bestowed upon it a soul. This felt almost the same as the time when Grim was being enveloped by the heart of the sorcerer world when he first advanced in his rank and became a full-fledged sorcerer. Virum. As a loud lingering noise echoed everywhere, a huge invisible force field was raised above the void fortress, forming a hemispheric defensive barrier just above the fortress. From afar, with the hemispheric force field covering the upper part of the metallic hemispheric fortress, the entire void fortress now looked like a gigantic sphere. In the meantime, as though it was being guided by some sort of powerful will, the Void Fortress started to descend downwards towards the Sorcerer World, dispersing layers after layers of clouds beneath while being guarded by several dozens of snail emissaries. Then, the Void Fortress landed within the Seven Rings' defensive cover without any resistance at all. As these were all happening, Harkening Whisperer bawled out an order. O oh, bright sorcerers and dark sorcerers on the Void Fortress! Summon forth your soul slaves! After giving her orders, she pumped up a surge of magical power into her staff and waved it in the air. In an instance, a huge black dimensional crater was torn open in the sky. As the crater opened up, various kinds of creatures, created and conjured from sorcery, were storming out of the crater in torrents. Screeches and bellows of all kinds could be heard everywhere, in the sky, on the ground, everywhere. Then, Thousands and thousands of black-white mosquitoes emerged and lined up in an orderly fashion in the sky, as though trying to fuse into a huge massive being. At the same time, two rows of soul slaves stormed out of the void fortress into the air. This was the soul slave army that Tomb Segja and Tomb Avera summoned forth. 
As three rows of slave souls flocked in the air, the spacious void fortress was now starting to feel very congested. Even the defensive force field was packed with all kinds of flying creatures. As the soul slaves rocked around like a fierce stream for a quarter of an hour, some powerful life forms started to emerge from the black dimensional crater. As Grimm raised his head, he could see a blob of mud flowing slowly out of the dimensional crater, it was a massive mud creature. It was so massive that even the hundred meter wide dimensional crater was not big enough for it to pass through in one go, it needed to take a lot of time to squeeze through the crater bit by bit. That was not all. There were countless gigantic creatures gathering behind the mud creature, clambering and squeezing through the crater at the same time. Suddenly, a ray of light flashed on Grimm's shoulder, it was the miner. Oh, damn it. Get your dirty ass wings away from me, the great Lord Miner, you stupid two-headed bird. As soon as he appeared, the miner quickly covered his nose with his wings as he snarled at the two-headed bird that was standing next to Grimm. Naturally, with how noisy the crowd was in the area, the miner's voice was utterly drowned out and went unheard. Roar! Suddenly, the two-headed bird turned its heads at the miner and let out a loud roar. It was quite apparent that the two-headed bird's roar was much louder than the miner's cackling complaints. Seeing that it won the shouting match while being able to hear the miner, the two-headed bird showed a smug face. In the meantime, several dozens of scorpion-like creatures that were standing on top of the two-headed bird were also making some hissing noise, as though laughing at and belittling the miner. Overwhelmed by anger, the miner barked furiously at the two-headed bird and scorpion-like creatures, you. Why you despicable lowlives? How dare you treat the great Lord Miner like this? I'll have your heads. HMPH. Before the miner was able to do anything, Grim grabbed him and placed him on his arms, coldly leering at the two-headed bird and scorpion-like creatures. Sensing possible threat, these soul slaves immediately squeezed their way among the crowd to get away from them, pushing other soul slaves over to them instead, the place was so overcrowded and jam-packed with creatures that there was no space for one to move about at all, be it on land or in the sky. Throwing the miner a stern glare, Grimm spoke calmly, as you can see, this is the situation right now. Now, behave. The conquest will begin soon. When it begins, be smart and do your best to keep a cool head. If you can't hold it in, just cower in the dimensional gap. Letting out a dissatisfied grunt, the miner took out a peanut from the dimensional gap and started to munch on his snack on Grimm's shoulder. Looking at Millie who was standing next to him, she had already summoned her gals and half-mantis half-snake soul slave. Cracking open the dimensional gap, Grim too summoned his five gals and had them encircle and guard him. One of the five gals was a replacement for the old Nor. Now that every sorcerer had summoned their soul slaves, the entire void fortress felt as though it was now a fully inflated balloon, and if this balloon were to burst in a foreign world, that entire world would shake and tremble. Grim peeked below the void fortress when he had the small window of opportunity to do so and a magnificent sight of an endless far-reaching magic array came into view. The majestic tree of life extended its widening crown towards the sky as long winding battle horns were heard blaring below. It was then Grim could feel that he was not one of those demon hunters who looked up to the sky and wondered what could have been below on the ground in Amor. He was now one of the protagonists who would be venturing into a new foreign world, conquering it and plundering its vast resources, the inhabitant specimens, soul slaves, and whatnots. As the void fortress landed on the tree of life's seven rings, a massive energy beam shot up from the tree and pushed the void fortress upwards, into the dimensional crater. Then, after a brief blur flash of light, suddenly, a massive scorching world filled with volcanoes and layers after layers of shadowy clouds, accompanied by countless waves of dark living creatures rushed into view. They had arrived at the shadow world. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. To the void fortress and demon hunters, crossing the barrier of time and space happened in the blink of an eye. Yet, to the Amornros, 
This scarlet moon had already been hanging in their world sky for a whopping seven months. To these lowly golden Amonros, this foreign world developing was an exciting opportunity for them to acquire more survival space, food, and offsprings. To them, this was a golden opportunity to overcome eons of hunger and harsh habitat once and for all. However, to the enigmatic Amonros, who were the ruling class of the Shadow World, something was definitely off. After establishing communication with the other great beings from other worlds, they knew what this scarlet moon meant it was an omen that an invasion from an evil world was imminent. An invasion from an evil powerful civilization called the Sorcerer World. That evil, old, powerful Sorcerer World would bring fires of war into the Amonro world and bring them to their knees. The great Amonros must stop all this from happening.